Welcome to another episode of our Dan Education Series. In this edition, we will be discussing the outcome of a workshop on flying after diving. A workshop was organized to consider the issue of flying after diving. And so various stakeholders from the diving industry, experts from the scientific and diving community, diving medical experts and travel agents all came together to essentially address two issues. Firstly, to review the current guidelines and experimental data developed since the first flying after diving trials or workshop done in 1989 and secondly to debate a consensus for new flying after recreational diving guidelines. Now previously the recommendations were as follows. A 12 hour wait was recommended after a single dive, 24 hours after a repetitive dive and 48 hours after a dive requiring decompression. This was considered overly conservative and subsequently Dan proposed a simpler 24-hour wait after all recreational diving. There were many objections to this on the grounds that decompression sickness risks were not that high and that such a long delay would cost a significant loss of business for island diving resorts. As a result, Dan undertook further flying after diving trials involving human subjects so that we could actually assess what the impact was and the actual risk of flying after diving, even if it was done in an experimental setting. The setting was the Duke University Center for Hyperbaric Medicine and Environmental Physiology and the studies were conducted between 1992 and 1999. The volunteers were dry, rested and tested on nine single and repetitive dive profiles that were all near the recompression diving no decompression limits. The dives were then followed by four hour simulated flights at 2,438 meters or essentially a cabin altitude of 8,000 feet. In 802 trials there were 40 decompression sickness incidents during or after flight. For single no stop dives to 18 meters of seawater or deeper there were no decompression sickness incidents for intervals of 11 hours or longer. But for repetitive, no stop dives, decompression sickness did occur for surface intervals of less than 17 hours. The results of the study were then used by the US Navy in the 1999 revision of its manual on the rules for ascent to altitude following air diving. The procedures were based on the diver's repetitive group designation upon surfacing from the dive and on the expected post-dive altitude. While they were not all formally tested in the laboratory setting prior to issue, no cases of decompression sickness have been reported to the Naval Safety Center to date. However, the number of times and dives and procedures that were actually done in the field were unknown. And there's a further consideration. What about flying with symptoms of decompression sickness? So the workshop recently reviewed as part of the flying after diving trials, the field data regarding flying after diving when diving with actual decompression sickness symptoms. There were potentially important differences between the field and chamber studies that need to be considered. Diving in the field involves immersion, exercise and multiple days of diving. While the chamber trials occurred on a single day with dry resting divers. 
So the chamber trials might not adequately simulate flying after diving as it actually occurs. As more divers fly with symptoms than develop symptoms during or after flight, flying with symptoms may be a greater health problem than the symptoms that occur during or after flight. This is an educational issue, not a scientific one. Divers need to be taught to seek medical advice rather than to fly if they note signs and symptoms consistent with decompression illness. So how about nitrox or oxygen pre-breathing to reduce the risk of decompression sickness in flying after diving? Well the benefits of breathing oxygen or a lower nitrogen mixture are obvious and trials were conducted by the Special Operations Command, SOCOM. This organization was concerned with high altitude parachute operations that might occur after air diving. Flying after diving trials were conducted with dry resting divers who breathed air while exposed for 60 minutes to 18 meter seawater. The dives were then followed by simulated flights of two or three hour durations at an altitude of 7,620 meters. It was demonstrated that this flight might cause decompression sickness even without previous diving. When the dive was followed by a 24-hour surface interval and three-hour flight, the divers breathing 30 minutes of oxygen immediately preceding flight were less likely and in fact there were no cases of decompression sickness in the 23 trials. So clearly there is an advantage. And this study indicated that A. Decompression sickness risk was low for flying after diving exposure at least for dry resting divers and B. Pre-flight oxygen might be an effective means for reducing decompression sickness risk. So how about now considering the possible impact of flying after diving rules on diving operations? One generally thinks of diving guidelines as based simply on medical safety. But safety is not the only yardstick that humans use for establishing rules for living. Economics also has a major impact, albeit not always an articulated one or one with which the medical community is comfortable. Economics were the primary issue in the 1991 discussion about the impact of Dan's proposed 24-hour flying after diving guideline. Offshore diving operations felt they would needlessly lose business with a single 24-hour guideline. So with this in mind, it was useful to approach the problem with a proper flying after diving model, including considering the economics, and thereby coming up with an optimal pre-flight surface interval. This would then combine the economic interests of the resorts and allay the concerns of the scientists and diving medical practitioners, as well as the insurers. Models of this nature depend on the assumptions and there's no model that can represent all situations but economic modeling can differentiate between important and less important factors. For example, in the model presented important factors included the cost of a dive, the number of days spent diving, the dive profile, the decompression sickness risk due to flying after diving and the overall risk and insurance or liability issues. Unimportant factors included the probability of evacuation, the cost of treatment, the diver's salary and the number of dives per day. The consensus process was then followed. Science is a quantitative activity. 
and while the determination of safety is a social process that considers the probability, severity and costs of injury, ultimately the knowledgeable representatives of society make decisions about society for safety at large and this is based on available information. The workshop participants were therefore asked to reach consensus concerning the following. A. Whether the flying after diving guidelines were needed for recreational diving and if so whether the current guidelines were adequate and B what the longest needed guideline might be and C if shorter guidelines would be appropriate for short dives. The ensuing discussion determined that guidelines were needed and that the evidence had been presented in such a way as to demonstrate that the existing guidelines were inadequate. After some debate it was decided that unless dive computers were used written guidelines for recreational diving should be simple and unambiguous without the need for references to tables such as the US Navy diving procedures. Three groups of divers were proposed for consideration. A. Uncertified individuals who took part in a resort or introductory scuba experience. B. Certified divers who made an unlimited number of no decompression air or nitrox dives over multiple days and C. Technical divers who made decompression dives or used helium breathing mixes. Here follows the consensus for flying after diving. A minimum of 12 hours surface interval was recommended for single no decompression dives and a minimum of 18 hours surface intervals was recommended for multi-day repetitive diving whereas substantially longer than 18 hours was recommended for diving involving compulsory decompression or dives involving either Heliox or Trimix. It needs to be stated that there are limitations to the experimental trials that were used in the workshop. Again, they were in a dry hyperbaric environment, in rested volunteers, and this may not represent divers who are in tropical climates and are actually immersed in water. For more information, look at the Divers Alert Network workshop publication on flying after diving. We hope that you found this useful and that this has added to your own decision about what to do about flying after diving. And remember to subscribe to our channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.